Like I you know, looked at the calendar. I looked at the calendar. Uh, so welcome folks, now that I've started the recording, might as well start from scratch. Um, I, I did move the quiz for those of you who didn't read the email to uh, a, a week from next Monday. So you have two weeks from today for the quiz. And the reason is very simple. The case is due before class on Wednesday. And the quiz actually is all about what you're working on in the case. The mechanics of what you're doing in the case is exactly what the quiz is about. So think of the case actually as a great review for the quiz, because as you start projecting things out, you're doing many of the things that the, that the quiz is. Obviously, I won't ask you the level of detail on the quiz that you had to work through in the case, but the mechanics of what you did is what the case, the, the second quiz is going to be built on. It's entirely on this investment analysis section. So keep working on the case. Don't worry about not starting on the quiz review till next Wednesday if need be, because you know the case itself is an excellent review for the quiz. The one thing I would caution you is I know it's a group project and there's a temptation to let the Excel Ninja take over and do the work, even if that is the case kind of un at least understand the mechanics of what's going on. So if, if, the, if the Excel stuff is getting too complicated for you, you might want to step back and ask, how would I build it if I were building it from scratch? Because um, you know, nothing in the case requires macros or macros on top of macros. So if you're doing that, then somebody's gone a little off the reservation. Okay. Any questions before we start? Okay. So last session, we were talking about dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. Now, one of the things you notice in the case is I've removed most of your uncertainty, right? Because I give you the numbers. And part of the reason for that is otherwise you'll each be doing whatever you want. And who knows, next thing you know, we'll, be, we'll have a hundred different cases going on. But even in the case, I've left some residual uncertainty. Things like depreciation methods, right? So... The suggestion I made is when you find yourself facing that residual uncertainty, make an assumption and move on. Do not get stuck on something that's not worth getting stuck on. Right? So today let's talk about the second way in which we talked about dealing with uncertainty, ask, asking what if questions. I know some of you are probably doing this on the case, right? What if this, what if that? And it's natural. But there are two things I suggest when you ask what if questions. One is less is more. Don't ask what if questions about every single variable involved because then you lose track and lose sight of what you're trying to do when you ask what if questions. And I'll give you an example built around the case you're doing. I mean, every year I write this case and every year the case is different. I, you know, I, so each year I try to make up stuff, but they're basically I'm testing you in the investment analysis section. And every year I do what I'm doing this year, which is to beg, to beg you to stay focused and Remember that your objective in the case is to make a decision, not to churn out page after page of tables and charts. And ultimately tell me whether you take the investment or not. Should Google take the GCAR? And if I haven't told this before, I want that delivered in a compact you know, brief, something that says, these are assumptions, this is what we found, this is what we'll do. And if you wanna ask what if questions, fine. But just remember those what if questions should lead you to a decision, not lead you away about uh, five or six years ago, you know, during this class, I'd thrown this case out and I'd given them exactly the same directions I gave you. And I forgot to put a page limit. I should have, but I forgot to put a page limit. So I get back the cases, there are about 80 cases in the class. And you know, most of them follow my, my suggestions, stay within five, six says, and one case stood out. It was like a book, 105 pages. So I opened it up, start leafing it through. They've run 101 scenarios on the case. 101 scenarios. Just saying, this is impressive. Here's what they found. In 53 of the scenarios, the project looked good. In 48 of the scenarios, the project looked bad. They got a positive NPV and negative net print. So they come to the final page where they have to give me the decision. And here's what they say. If you know the project is going to be a good project, take the project. If you think it's gonna be a bad project, don't. This is very helpful advice, but you can see why they ended up there, right? You run enough scenarios, you completely lose track of whether you're coming or going. 
The key here is you want to converge on a decision, not diverge. So if you find yourself spending hours on some diversion, and at the end of the hours, you say, guys, we're more confused than we were when we started down this diversion. It's time to come back to the main path because you've lost sight of what you're trying to do. Less is more. Second, please, for God's sake, don't turn out table after table of numbers. Because I make a confession. I'm not going to look through 50 tables. I promise you, I will look through the first two and abandon the remaining 48. So unless you reference something in your text for your decision, I'm not looking at it. I know you put a lot of work in it, but if you're not going to base a decision or tell me why it matters, why would I look at table 53? And if you can take your what-if analysis and make it into a picture, do so. I'm going to show you my favorite, you know, and this is a picture that's a hundred, I think a couple of hundred years old. Favorite what if analysis, a picture that basically delivers a thousand words. It's from a book called The Visual Display of Information. I don't know whether any of you have read this book. It's a book by a guy called Edward Tufte, T-U-F-T-E. I think he's a professor at Princeton or Yale. I don't know which school, but his specialty is presenting information visually. So when you look at, think about companies like Tableau, you might have heard of, uh, this is a company that is very creative in, in giving you. They're built around much of the work he did and he did his work 40, 50 years ago. So in that book he presented, what to me still remains my favorite graph of all time. You know what he showed in the graph? Napoleon's ill-fated expedition to invade Russia, what, 220 years ago. Now, let's back up, you know, you know, you know, Napoleon becomes emperor of France, you know, guy has, you know, delusions of being the world's emperor. And of course, he decides to invade Russia. Why? Because that seems to be a thing that European monarchs seem to have. Let's go invade Russia. It's out there. It's big. Let's invade Russia. So Napoleon gathers together this huge army and he sets off towards Russia. So here's the picture that Tufti that, that, that Tuft pulled up from a book that actually talked about Napoleon. So this was actually a book written 170 years ago. So this entire graph was drawn by hand. You say, what does this graph show? See the width of this line leaving this, this light brown? That's Napoleon's army leaving Paris. Huge army, lots of different regiments. You know. And Napoleon's of course leading the army on a horse. So, they, you know, so they leave, they're leaving, they're marching through Europe. You saying, what are these little tangents? That's when they get distracted and invade Poland and Hungary along the way. They're in the way, let's invade them. But they keep going. And notice that as they're going, the width of the line is getting smaller. That's basically people dying along the way. They keep going and going. And then they discover that they're into Russia. But they also discover that what a lot of people trying to invade Russia have discovered. It's a really big place. So they keep marching. See the end of this, this light brown? That's Napoleon and his army. Now about a third of its size on the outskirts of Russia, on the outskirts of Moscow. If you've ever been to Moscow, there's actually a gate that, 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 uh, that, 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 that is a memorial to this actual attempt to invade. Because what happened was you know, Napoleon got all the way to this point and it was mid-December in Moscow. Have any of you been to Moscow in mid-December? I did it once. I'm never going back in mid-December. It's really, really, really cold. And that was exactly what Napoleon thought. This is really cold. I want to go home. So here's Napoleon's army now in black on their march home. And in this graph, you can see the temperature as they're marching back. As the temperature drops, look at the size of Napoleon's army. By the time he's got back to Paris, there are three guys carrying Napoleon back. This is a great graph. In one graph, he's captured the entire story of how Napoleon tried to invade Russia and failed. Come on, all you have to show me is whether Google should build a G car if its margins change. Your, your challenge is a much smaller one. Find a creative way of showing me how your decision might change as your margin change, the market share changes. That's the reason we ask what if questions. So any, any follow-ups on what if questions? So keep it focused on what you think matters. And then remember your ultimate objective is to make a better decision. 
Now I'm going to present you a third way of dealing with uncertainty. And this approach would not have been practical 30 years ago. It's called a Monte Carlo simulation. The reason it wouldn't have been practical is 30 years ago, you'd have needed access to a mainframe computer and millions of dollars to be able to run a Monte Carlo simulation. So let's back up and think about what a Monte Carlo simulation is. Remember when I showed you my numbers for the theme park, I projected revenues and I projected cost being 60% of revenues. Every estimate I gave you was a point estimate. You know what I mean by point estimate? I gave you a number. This is what my growth rate, this is what my margin is. But part of me was screaming, but I could be wrong. The cost could be 60%, but they might be 70 or 50. What I've done in a Monte Carlo simulation, which is, and this is what you do in any Monte Carlo simulation, is I've taken those point estimates and made them into distributions. In particular, I took three of my assumptions that I'm feeling most uncertain about. The first is revenues. Remember, I based the Rio Disney theme park revenues on what I knew in Disney World and Disneyland and Euro Disney and Tokyo Disney, but this is a Latin American theme park. So I said, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it'll draw more people than I expected or less people. And I kept it simple. I said, let my base case revenues be the middle of the distribution, but I'm gonna allow revenues to be plus or minus 20%. And the distribution is uniform, which means it could be in any of these numbers are equally probable. So revenues could be 20% higher or 20% lower than expected. Second, I took my operating expenses, if you remember, and I made them 60% of revenues based on what I learned in my other theme parks. But Rio is very different. Maybe the cost will be higher or lower. And again, I've built the distribution around the 60%. This is called a triangular distribution, which means that I still think 60% is the most likely number, but it could be higher or lower. And finally, one of the things I worry about when investing in a Rio theme park is the risk of Brazil as a country. I built that in through a country risk premium, but it's still a point estimate. So I made that country risk premium a distribution, allowing it to be much higher or lower. Brazil could get riskier or safer over time. So you think, what do I do with these distributions? In a Monte Carlo simulation, here's what I do. I go into the first distribution, act like you've closed your eyes and each of these numbers is in a glass bowl. That's how Monte Carlo simulations were first devised, is people would write every possible number and sheets of paper, put them in a glass bowl, pick a number out of the bowl. I go in and pick a number out of the revenue distribution. It could be that my revenues come in at 105% of my estimate, higher than expected. Then I go into my operating expense bowl, pick a, pick a number out. Maybe it comes in at 62% of 60%. And my country risk premium, I pick a number and it comes in at 4%, sort of 3.3%. I run my project analysis with that, with that number, with those numbers. Then I do it again and again and again. How many times? If you were doing this manually, you'd get physically tired. You probably can run it a thousand times. But a computer never gets tired. And here's the advantage we have that we did not have 30 years ago. I have access to a program called Crystal Ball. And incidentally, each of you has access to Crystal Ball as well. It's one of the Stern apps you can download. What does Crystal Ball do? It takes your Excel spreadsheet you've built for any analysis, whether it's capital budgeting or valuation or the Google G car. And it makes the numbers you've entered as inputs, into, it allows you to enter the numbers as distributions. So you can say, well, I expect the cost structure G car to be $4,000 a car. And by the way, there's a distribution around that. And you know what the default in crystal ball is? It runs 10,000 simulations in a minute. In fact, just to test it, I've set it as high as 500,000 simulations. It takes it about five minutes to run. And each simulation, remember, you get a net present value. And at the end of the process, here's what crystal ball gives you. Not only does it give you an average across the simulation, in this case, the average was 3.4 billion and a median of 3.28 billion across the, the 100,000 simulations. It also gives you a distribution of NPVs. Remember what the rule is, if the NPV is positive, you should take the project, right? And here's what the distribution tells me. The NPV is positive 88% of the time it's negative 12% of the time. So what is the, the analysis telling you? There's a 12% chance that you've taken a bad project, but an 88% chance you've taken a good project. The median and the average are actually, actually pretty close to what I got in my base case, which should not be surprising because I built the distributions around my base case assumptions.
This is an incredibly powerful tool. And the learning curve is zero. I mean, you pick up crystal ball in five minutes, you'll be off to the, the races because all you would do is take a cell where you had a number and make it into a distribution. The only caveat I would have is to use crystal ball, you need to remember some basic statistics. If the only distribution you remember from your statistics class is the normal distribution, please don't run crystal ball because then everything will be normally distributed. It's garbage in, garbage out. But if you're willing to invest some time understanding distributions, it's a great way in which you can build in your uncertainties into the analysis and see how it plays out in the answer. Any questions about, about, about Monte Carlo simulations? Okay. So I'm not, so don't take this the wrong way. Don't go and make your G-car analysis into a Monte Carlo simulation. If the capacity to do it, I don't, I don't want you to go there. But remember that this is a tool you have available, whether you're valuing companies or doing capital budgeting analyses to deal with your uncertainty in a healthy way by facing up to it, putting a distribution on it and bringing it into your analysis. Any questions on any of the tools for, Monte, for dealing with uncertainty? So now I'm going to make you the decision maker. Okay. So Dan, you can be my decision maker at Disney. Remember your job all through this has been, I'm the number crunch, you're the decision maker. i am now run this Monte Carlo simulation. I give you the median value, 3.29 billion. But I also say there's about a 10, 11% chance that the net present value could be negative. In other words, I'm being open about the fact, hey, I've done all my homework, but there's still a chance the NPV should, is negative. As a decision maker, how do you use this? In, because previously I just gave you NPV positive, take it or leave it. Now I've given you a distribution. How would you use this information, Dan? Um, I would accept the investment because mm -hmm. it seems like logical that most of the time the net present value is positive and the projects aren't mutually exclusive. Is that correct? Isn't well, in a, in a sense, if you rejected any project where you don't have a 100% chance that the net present value is positive, you know what's going to happen, right? Almost no project is going to pass muster because you've set the standards too high. You can be too conservative. But there's also something actionable you can do, right? You can look at the 10 to 12% of the cases where your net present value is negative and ask, what can I do? to protect myself against those cases. Let's suppose those cases happen only when the operating expenses exceed 70% of revenue. So remember the outcomes are a function of what the inputs are. Let's say you notice a clustering that this happens because your operating expenses are out of control. Maybe you can reach out to the unions you're gonna be working with in the Rio Disney theme park, come up with arrangements that give you more predictable costs and take that extreme scenario off the table. So it's a combination of both. So when I do what if analyses, it's not just to make a better decision, but also to follow up and run that project better after the fact. No. So later on, we're gonna talk about doing this in the context of hedging. Is hedging going to help you? Maybe the hedging is a way in which you can remove those extreme outcomes that make the project a negative net present value project. But I think it's so much richer to be able to make decisions on a distribution rather than a single value. Because before this, remember, all I gave you is NPV is 3.2 million, take it or leave it. Now, at least you have the richness of all of this additional information where not only can you make better decisions, but you can follow them up with better actions. Any other questions on Monte Carlo simulations before we move on? Brian? Would it be helpful to multiply that NPV you get, the median, by 10% zero? You know, to take no, that that's already, right it's now. already factored in, right? Because this is across all your NPVs. So basically, the average already factors in. The median is the 50th percentile, so I wouldn't be able to adjust the median, but the average already factors in those terrible outcomes. Ashwin? Uh, Professor, couldn't you just take an expected value of, uh, so uh, your negative NPVs times the probability of each of those outcomes and then see if your expected value is positive and make a decision that way? It is positive, right? Because I gave you the expected value. It's what the average is. The reason that's almost useless 
is what do you think it's going to be? Because your base case assumptions and the ones you're centering the distributions are, are the same, 60% margin. So you, what you get as an average across the simulation should be very close to what you got in your base case analysis, right? There's no magic here. And that's why when people say, I've removed the uncertainty because I've taken an expected value, they have no idea what they're talking about. You cannot remove uncertainty by taking an expected value because that negative NPV is already built in. The expected value will reflect that. So in this case, it is positive because if that were negative, I would reject the project, right? So, it's, so that's already built into the, the expected value. Got Any it. other questions? Okay. So now let's move to a second project. Now in the Disney analysis, if you, if, you, if you think back to what I did, I started with the revenue, subtracted operating expenses, stopped at operating income and act like that paid taxes and operating income. You know what I mean by stopped at operating income, right? Disney's gonna borrow money for this project but I ignored interest expenses entirely. Why? Because I was looking at returns to the entire project, returns on capital. I was looking at cash flows to all claim orders, cash flows to the firm. I could have taken a very different perspective here and focused on this project entirely through the eyes of equity investors. You saying, what does that mean? If I'm using accounting returns then I'm going to focus on return and equity, what's my net income? What's the equity invest in this project and compare that to the cost of equity. Remember for the Disney project, compared everything to the cost of capital. When I do my cash flows, I'm going to look at cash flows left over after debt payments, interest and principal payments, and discount those back at the cost of equity, and then compare that to the equity investment of the project. This is a choice you have to make upfront. And I'll make a recommendation. If you have to do project analyses, it's much richer, much easier doing what I did with Disney than what I'm going to do on my next project, where I'm going to focus on equity investors. But for God's sakes, don't mix and match. Don't bring in things into the two and try to combine the two because that's when you end up being inconsistent. So let's set up my project. There's lots of words in this page, kind of ignore it. I'll tell you basically what this project is. It's an iron ore mine that Vale is planning to invest in in Canada. The investment, there'll be an initial investment of 1.25 billion and the production capacity of this mine is 8 million tons of iron ore. That initial investment will be depreciated down over 10 years, down to a salvage value of 250 million. So it's a finite life project. So here, we're not going to play the games that we did at Disney. Remember in Disney, we kept the project going and going. And iron ore mine, you can't keep going and going. Once the iron ore is out of the ground, there's no iron ore left after your 10. The variable cost of production is expected to be $45 per ton. And there's a fixed cost of 125 million. Now, both costs will grow with the inflation rate. So I've given you the information about the cost structure, the capacity, and the cost will be in Canadian dollars, and they'll be converted into US dollars. And the time that I did this, the inflation rate in the two currencies was roughly the same. So a US dollar and a Canadian dollar, that, that parity will continue. Finally, working capital will be 20% of revenues, but in this case, I'm gonna assume that the investment is needed at the beginning of each year. Do you remember what it was in the case of Disney? There, the working capital investment happened at the end of each year. It's one of those artifacts of how we do discounted cash flow valuation. That's a little awkward, but everything in a DCF happens on one day, right? December 31st, December 31st. And here I'm giving you a sense of when the investment is going to be made. The corporate tax rate is 34%. So I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to try to do. And I want you to focus on what I'm doing differently in this project as opposed to the Disney theme park. So here's what I did. I started by making first looking at the debt because I'm going to be focused on equity. I have to think about things like what's, when's the debt due? How much debt is, is going to get repaid? So one of the things that I mentioned was that the, there's, a, there's an initial investment, but half a billion of that investment is going to come from debt and it's going to be a term loan. You know what a term loan is? A typical 30-year mortgage in the US is a term loan. What does that mean? Every month you make a fixed payment. Every month for the 360 months you have. The portion of that payment early on that is interest is going to be very large and the portion that's principal is going to be very small. I know people who've taken 30-year mortgages and they make their payments for the first year and they look at the principal due 
And they say, what happened? I've been making these payments. The principal due looks like very close to what it was at the start of the year. That's the nature of term loans is the early payments will be mostly interest and very little principal. And the later payments will be mostly principal and very little interest. They say, why do you care how much is interest and principal? Lee, why do we care what, what portion of the debt is interest and what portion is principal? You're still making the total payment. So why do I break it down into interest and principal? Um, I'm not sure. Um, oh, would it be that the interest you get um, a tax benefit on? Bingo, that's it, right? That's why when you make your mortgage payments, at the end of the year, your mortgage company will actually send you a disclosure statement how, saying how much of your payments are interest because that's the portion that's tax deductible. So here, what I've done is I've taken my total payment every year, which is always 61.8 million. You know how I come up with that payment? You basically know how much your loan is. You know the interest rate is. You can back out the payment you will need to make to pay off the loan. So 61.8 million. In year one, 20.25 million is interest. 41.55 million is principal. Saying, how are you getting the 20.25 million? If you take your beginning debt and multiply it by 4.05%, you get 20.25 million. So basically the interest is computed based on my starting principal. The remaining amount, 61.8 minus 20.25 is the principal repaid in year one. Once you do that, you've got the remaining debt, 500 minus 41. So next year I start with, so I do this every year. So notice what happens to the interest portion of my payment as I go through time. It goes from 20.25 to 2.41. And by the time I get to year 10, almost all of my payment is principal. And if I've done my math right, there should be no debt due. So I pay 61.8 million, but I know how much is interest and how much is principal. Now let's talk about what hurdle rate I'm gonna use in this project. Because I'm gonna be equity focused in this project, all I care about is the cost of equity. I'm not gonna do cost of debt and cost of capital because this is an equity analysis. So here's what I decided to do. I decided to do the analysis entirely in US dollar terms. Why? This is a Brazilian company, but it's investing in a Canadian project, but the commodity is always based in dollars. So I'm going to do US dollars. So the risk-free rate is the US T bond rate. But to get to a cost of equity, I draw, go back to that table. If you remember, I did a bottom-up beta for Vale based on the businesses they're in. I took the cost of equity for just, um, uh, the cost of equity for just the iron ore mining business, 11.13%. Now, of course, I gave you the numbers to do cost of capital and cost of equity and capital in re terms, but the number that I care about is the cost of equity in US dollars. Let me emphasize again, that's because I'm doing my analysis in dollars and I'm doing it in equity terms. So you're going to see 11.13% as my discount rate. Is everybody clear on that? So if I asked you which discount rate in this table should I pick, it's going to be based on what currency I've chosen to do the analysis in and whether I'm looking at cash flows after debt payments or before debt payments. Here, because I'm looking at cash flows after debt payments, cash flows to equity, I'm going to go with the cost of equity. So now let me grind through the numbers. And it's a grind because this is basically building up the spreadsheet and coming up with the revenues and expenses each year. So what you see up front, up top, is my production every year. The capacity is 8 million tons, but it takes me a while to get there. So years one and two, I'm actually below capacity as the fact, as the mine kicks into full capacity. The price per ton is $100 per ton growing at the inflation rate, which is 2%. So if you look at the price, it's 102, 104, 106, all the way up to 121.9. I'm doing my analysis in US dollar terms. Could I have done it in real terms? Absolutely. But then my discount rate would have to be a real discount rate. So we'll come back and ask, should I, could I, maybe I should have gone that way. But here I've chosen to do it in US dollars. So I'm building the inflation. My revenues is just my production times the price per ton. Let's go to the variable costs. The variable costs are in a sense almost given. If you look at the cost per ton, it's $45 per ton. So basically it's the same way that I do revenues. I do variable costs. And as my revenues go up, my variable costs go up with revenues. So it's almost in, in, in tandem. My fixed costs start at 125 million, but because they are fixed and they grow at the inflation rate, 
they start to become a smaller and smaller percent of revenues as you go through time and your revenues pick up. In fact, that is going to be the engine that allows me to make money is the costs are not going proportionately with the revenues. So if you look at my operating income, now after depreciation, I have a loss in year one, and then I turn profitable as I go into full capacity. That's where I stopped with the Disney analysis. Remember I stopped at EBIT? Here, I'm actually going to estimate interest expenses. Why? Because I'm an equity investor. I've got to pay those expenses out. So I use the interest expenses. And that's why I had to do that table first and subtract them out to get to taxable income. Then I compute the taxes on the taxable income and come up with net income. So again, I want people to be very clear on the distinction between operating and net income. If you still are unclear about that, I would go back and watch my accounting session on earnings because that's deadly. If you really are confused about what's the difference in your operating and net income, you're going to get into trouble in this kind of analysis. Operating income is before interest expenses. Net income is after interest expenses. And here I'm focusing on net income. For the book value, I did what I did with Disney. Take the beginning book value, subtract our depreciation, add CapEx. But here's the difference again. Because I'm equity focused, I'm looking at only the equity portion of that book value. So I'm looking at net income, which is equity income and book equity. So book equity is the equity portion. And as I go through time, that equity portion comes down because I'm writing off the investment, the investment's getting smaller. So it's a shift in focus. In Disney, I looked at operating income and I looked at invested capital. In this project, I'm looking at net income, which is after interest expenses and book equity. If you remember in Disney, once I got the income and the invested capital, I computed a return on invested capital. Here, I take net income and divide by book equity. And I do exactly what I did with Disney, right? Take the average value, take the ending value, doesn't really matter. My return in equity starts at minus 10%, no surprise because I'm lo losing money, but it climbs over time. Why? Because I'm making the project smaller, I'm depreciating the project. My average return in equity in US dollar terms on this project is 31.36%. Professor? Yes. Sorry, not a math question, but can you close your calendar alarm? Because it covers a part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So any questions on, I want people to be clear, even if you're fuzzy on the details or what I, I want you to be clear on the big picture difference between what I did in my Disney case and what I did here. The Disney case, I looked at earnings before debt payments. Here, I'm looking at earnings after debt payments. In the Disney case, I looked at total amount invested in the project. Here, I'm focusing only the equity invested in the project. In the Disney case, I computed return on all capital. Here, I'm looking at return on just equity. And finally, the Disney case, I compared to the cost of capital. Here, I'm comparing just to the cost of equity. So when you get a chance, actually take a page, draw a line down the middle, put capital in one side equity, take all of the different measures and you're very quickly going to see that everything we do is consistent with whose perspective we're bringing to a project. Now, as I did with uh, return on capital, I can look at a company's return on equity and compare it to its cost of equity, right? So I can take the net income divided by book equity. So for Disney in 2013, when I did that, my return on equity was 14.62%. So I'm taking just the net income divided by book equity. But if I compute return in equity, I should be comparing to the cost of equity. And the cost of equity for Disney in 2013 was 8.52%. Any questions about accounting returns on equity versus capital? So the focus is different. The comparison is therefore also different. I've had a few people ask about the case on what to do with interest expenses. Go back and review what we just talked about because the answer is embedded in whose perspective you're bringing, what you're comparing your returns to because that's gonna tell you what to do about the fact that you might have debt and interest expenses. So you're not acting like there's no debt in the Disney case. You're just embedding it into your capital and comparing it to cost of capital. So that's why there's no interest expense in the Disney theme park and there's interest expense here. Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, I think you might've mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but could you remind me like 
why do you choose to do a return on equity versus return on capital? You can do either, right? If you most of the time, the two will lead you to the same place. The only reason you might pick one over the other is because a particular investor. I mean, a lot of investors think in equity terms. If I ask you how much money do you make in your business, almost none of us thinks about money before we pay the back, right? We think about money left over. So, intuitive often to think in equity terms. Okay. So that's why some people prefer to deal with equity. And what I'm pointing out is if you prefer to deal with equity, it's just a lot more work because you got to, because remember the Disney case, I didn't even break down the debt. There was no debt repayment. If you go the equity route, you have to bring, make those explicit, but it might be closer to your intuitive thinking about, hey, this is what I'm making the project. So many real estate developers, for instance, you ask how much money do you make in the building? We'll always think in equity terms because then don't think of the bank as a partner. The bank is an adversary. You pay off the capital and what's left over is yours. So just, I think, a question of intuition and what you, you're more comfortable working with. But whatever approach this, you decide to work with, just be consistent with everything being defined in those terms. Brian? If you go back a slide, what's the uh, purpose of the average book value? Is that last year's equity Well, I think it's, a, it, I'll tell you one thing. Have you heard of mid-year conventions? It, a lot of people make this big deal about the fact that you don't make money on December 31st of every year because artificially that's what we do in this kind of cash flow evaluation. We act like everything happens. Their point is you make it over the course of the year. You see where that leads next, right? If you make it over the course of the year, their argument is the middle of the year is actually a better thing to focus on because that's when your cash flows tend to come in. So when you use that average, you're staying close to the mid year. I think we make too much of a big deal about this end of the year because if the only way your project turns good is because you move the mid year to a, the end of the year to a mid year convention, you have a pretty shaky project to begin with. But I do the average simply to cater to those people who are big on that mid-year convention and think about things happening towards the middle of the year rather than the end of the year. Any other questions? So now let's do a cash flow analysis. Because return equity is still an accounting number. And we, we've already said we don't trust accounting numbers. So here's what I'm going to do to get from earnings to cash flows. The first three line items I'm going to use will look very familiar because I did them with Disney as well. I'm going to add back depreciation and amortization. Remember, we did that with the Disney theme park. Why? Because these are accounting expenses. They're not cash expenses. I'm going to subtract out CapEx. Why? Because CapEx is a cash outflow. I'm going to subtract out change in non-cash working capital to make accrual earnings into cash earnings. But then you see one final line item that I did not have on the Disney theme park, debt repayments. Why? I'm staying consistent, right? The equity investor, I've got to pay off the debt. So the principal repayments I had in that table come out of my cash flows. So free cash flow to equity, which is what this is, is very much like cash flow to the firm. It's after debt payments though, rather than before debt payments. You're saying, what's a big number at the end of year 10? In the Disney theme park, what did I do at the end of year 10? Do you remember? Morgan, do you remember what I did at the end of year 10 in the real Disney theme park? Did I shut the, so let me lead you on. Did I shut the theme park down after year 10? No. I let it continue, you know, forever. And I put in this inflation rate growth, what that allowed me to do is come up with a terminal value. I can't do that with an iron ore plant. I can't let it run forever. There's no iron ore left. So at the end of year 10, you know what? I shut the plant down and I get back my salvage value. And if you do that, the most convenient assumption to make is you get your book value back. You know why that's the most convenient? Most convenient? Because if I assume any salvage value that's higher or lower than the book value, would I have, let's assume that I think that the salvage value could be a half a billion rather than 250 million. Kushal, what's going, what do I have to deal with if I let the salvage value be different from the book value? So I've written it down to 250, I sell it for 500. I've got a capital gain, right? Then what do I have to do? The IRS comes knocking on my door for taxes. The advantage of salvaging at book value 
is your dump. That is your salvage value. And I put it in 250 million in your tank. So those are my cash flows to equity. I discount them back at my cost of equity. A dollar cost of equity because it's a dollar cash flow. So basically the 11.13% cost of equity. And what I get as my NPV is $304 million. Again, it's positive. So it's a good project. I would take it. But I want, if you get a chance, I want you to compare these two analyses because this is one of the most mangled parts of financial analysis, not just in capital budgeting, but in valuation. But people forget whether they're looking at the firm or equity, and then they get completely confused and use the wrong discount rate and the wrong cash flows. By comparing these two examples, you can see what I do differently and why I end up using cost of capital as my discount rate for the Disney theme park, but cost of equity as my discount rate here. Any questions on design or project? Okay. So here I decide to ask some what if questions. It's an iron ore mining project, right? So what am I dependent on? I'm dependent on a bunch of different things, but let me start with the IRR first. The IRR on this project, just like on the Disney project, if I hold everything else constant, is about 27, 28%, well above my cost of equity. So you're probably saying, why are we wasting our time even doing IRR if it confirms the NPV? Most of the time, when you have single projects, you're right. If your net present value is positive, your IRR is also going to be greater than your hurdle rate. You do it almost just for completion because somebody's going to ask you about the IRR. But it's also true that this project could have been done entirely in real terms. I want everybody to clear, be clear about the difference between real and nominal. When you do things in nominal terms, you try to bring inflation into your cash flows. You push up your cash flows if there's inflation. You also bring inflation into your discount rate through a risk-free rate. If you want to do everything in real terms, you take inflation out of both numbers. So let's assume I'd done this entire analysis in real terms. I'm gonna ask you two separate questions. Remember the discount rate I used in US dollar terms was 11.13%. If I did my entire analysis in real terms, instead of nominal terms, would I end up with a lower discount rate or a higher discount rate? So 11.13% is my US dollar cost of equity. If I did everything in real terms, would I end up with a lower or a higher discount rate? Shruti? Um, I, I'm not sure if my answer is right, but I would think it would be a lower, a lower discount tell, rate if you're not and, um, incorporating inflation in there. Exactly. So you take the 2% inflation, I'm roughly speaking, going to end up with like a 9 point, because my inflation rate was 2%, I'd end up with like a 9% or 9.13%. This is good, right? I have a lower discount rate. But then when I do my cash flows, what would I do differently? If I'm doing everything in real terms, remember the price of iron ore, I assume would go from 100 to 102 to 104. That came from inflation helping me along, right? So if I do everything in real terms, you know what my price will be? $100 all the way through. I'll have lower cash flows. I'll save you the trouble. If you do everything in real terms, your discount rate will be about 2% lower. Your cash flows will also have the same drop because you're taking the same inflation out of your cash flows. Your NPV is going to be exactly the same. Just as it was when I switched from dollars to reais, right? Inflation is the key bogeyman. And if I shift consistently, it doesn't really matter whether I do things in real terms or nominal terms. So if you don't believe me, go back to the, you know, download the, uh, the, uh, the, the Vale Iron Ore project, use a real discount rate and a real cash flows and you'll get exactly the NP same NPV. So I'm gonna ask two what if questions on this project and neither, is what, neither of the what if questions have anything to do with what the company does. They are macro questions. You know what I mean by macro questions about something happening that the company doesn't control. The first is the iron ore price is an assumption, right? Commodities go up in price. Think of what happened to oil last year when it went from $60 down to $30 a barrel. I looked at what would happen to the NPV of this particular mine as the iron ore price goes from, now I think $60 a barrel to $130 a barrel. My default assumption was 100. 
But if the iron ore price drops to $90 a ton, my net present value goes to zero. If it drops to $80 a ton, it becomes negative. So there's almost a break-even iron ore price of about $88 or $89. File that away. So if iron ore prices drop a lot, no surprise, this mine goes from being a good investment to a bad investment. The other big question I asked was about exchange rates. Remember, I have this mine in Canada and my revenues are in US dollars. I have a currency mismatch. I assume that parity would continue, that a dollar, US dollar and a Canadian dollar would be at rough parity. But could I be wrong? Absolutely. So here what I've done is I've looked at what happens if the Canadian dollar gets stronger versus the Canadian dollar getting weaker. If the Canadian dollar gets weaker, my net present value actually gets higher. You see why? My costs are all in Canadian dollars. So if it gets weaker, my costs are actually going down. If the Canadian dollar gets stronger, my net present value becomes much lower. So there are two big macro variables I'm worried about. One is exchange rates moving in directions I didn't anticipate, the, dollar, the Canadian dollar getting stronger. The second is iron ore prices. But those are risks you can hedge away, right? Because you can buy futures in iron ore, you can buy futures on exchange rate futures. So I'm gonna ask you a question that I think almost every company that's exposed to macro risk asks, should we hedge that risk? But the mistake they make is, you know who they ask this question? A banker. And what's a banker selling? Risk management products. You're my banker, you've got all these neat exchange rate risk management products and I ask you, should I manage exchange rate risk? What do you think the answer is going to be? Of course. And we have the perfect product for you. But I want you to think about whether this is good for you as a company. Should you be hedging? against iron ore. In fact, I'm gonna separate the two macro risks and we'll talk about why. You could go out and hedge against iron ore prices. Should Vale be hedging against future iron ore prices? Sarah, you, you, you nodded no, tell me why not. Why shouldn't a commodity company, an oil company, an iron ore company be going out and hedging against iron ore, against the commodity price? I mean, I would, my um, inclination is to say that they're essentially shooting themselves in the foot as somebody that's investing in this resource. If they go yeah. out and hedge I against them. I wish they were shooting themselves in the foot. You know who they're shooting in the foot? The investors <laughs> in the company. Do you see why? Why do you invest in an oil company? It's because you love the way ExxonMobil is managed. I don't think so. You invest in an oil company because you're making a better in oil prices, right? And if ExxonMobil goes out and hedges against oil prices. Your response is, what the heck are you guys doing? This is a challenge that commodity companies have faced and some of them failed. There was a time when Barrick, which is one of the biggest gold mining companies in the world, chose to hedge against gold prices in a period where gold prices went up 50%. You know what happened to the entire top management as a result? They got fired and they deserve to be fired. If this is your business, you shouldn't be hedging against why I'm investing in the first place. But I'll give you one exception. If you're a highly levered oil company, you have a lot of debt, then you might want to hedge at least some of your production. Do you see why? Because even if you think oil prices will come back, you have to survive. So when you have a lot of debt and you worry about survival, maybe I'll cut you some slack and say, okay, so, so you're a shale oil company, you hedge against oil price risk, good for you. But if you're Exxon Mobil doing this, I don't see any benefit that investors get from this. So any, any questions, Michael? Um, I had a question back on the real versus, versus nominal change in cash flow. Um, it sounded like, and this might be wrong, but it sounded like that rest, the fact that it's different rests on the assumption that variable cost won't change with inflation. Because um, if it will, then then the cash yeah. flows shouldn't be. Why are we assuming that, that that won't change with inflation? Well, I could, if, if they would, I would have to give you the function by which they change, right? So if, we can't, if I we, believe we can't that, if, so the variable costs are a percentage of revenues, 
So here, when my revenues are low, my very because I gave you the prompt that, in fact, I was explicit in the prompt. I said variable cost is $45 per ton and it'll grow at the inflation rate for the next 10 years. So you're saying that, what if that assumption is different? Or because I was explicit about what variable costs would do. I'm not assuming it. I'm, I was explicit that variable costs are fixed, but the only thing that I have to worry about is inflation being built into that. If that's not true, then I have to tell you exactly how they would change. And you'd have to then reduce them by the inflation rate, which might help you or hurt you depending on how fast they're growing. But either way, there's nothing that prevents you from doing it if you feel that that cost will grow at a rate that's different from inflation. But whatever that number is, you've got to take the inflation effect out of it. So everybody kind of agree that you should, if you're a commodity company, you should generally think very carefully about hedging against commodity price risk because this is the reason I'm investing in you. But what about exchange rates? Should I hedge against? Do you know that the most hedged macro risk in the world is exchange rate risk? By far. A lot of companies do it. Should you be hedging against exchange rates? Fabian, what do you think? You'd be my banker. Give me the good side of hedging against exchange rates. What, uh, you know, how would you convince me that hedging is good? What are you going to show me? Well, one, it's, I mean, you're, you're trying to mitigate the, the risk that, you know, things you can't control with the. But tell me as a manager why this is going to make my life so much easier. If I hedge exchange rate risk, what are my earnings going to look like? Every quarter I report earnings, right? Let's say I'm a company with exposure to 16 countries. When I hedge exchange rate risk, what have I done to my earnings? I've made them more stable, right? Yeah. Basically, I've removed that exchange rate component. That's a big sales pitch that bankers make, is if you hedge against exchange rate risk, your earnings become more predictable. That's absolutely true, because you've removed that risk. But what's the other thing that you, if I were truly thinking about my shareholders, what's the next question I would need to address? Does making my earnings more stable give me a higher stock price, right? Because if investors don't care about exchange rate risk, my hedging it away is just creating a cost that they would rather not have. You bring that up with a banker, they will change the topic so quickly, you won't even remember what you were talking about. You know why? Because there's zero evidence that removing exchange rate risk from earnings actually pays off as higher stock prices. And you can see this play out often when companies report earnings for a quarter. If they had a big movement in exchange rate that caused damage to earnings, they will separate the earnings effect before and after exchange rate. So investors can see how much of their earnings was caused by exchange rate movements. And the reason they do it is investors are not stupid. They know that exchange rates are a gift that gives you in one quarter that takes away in another that kind of evens out over time. But the pitch that exchange rate, hedging exchange rate risk will make your earnings more stable is absolutely true. The question of whether that pays off your investors is an entirely different question. And I'll tell you my tiebreaker. If your investors are people like BlackRock and State Street and Fidelity, I have zero business managing exchange rates. You know why? Because they invest in 500 companies. Some are helped by a stronger dollar. Others are hurt by a stronger dollar. Why should each company be going out there and hedging risks if you could do this on your own? So should I be hedging exchange rate risks? My answer is no. What if the mine were in Brazil? Given that the Brazilian RIA is more volatile, maybe you'd be more tempted. But ultimately, it's a question of will my investors benefit by my removing the risk? And that has to come from looking at who the investors in your company are. And for Vale, the problem is the investors in the company tend to be a lot of domestic Brazilian investors and the Brazilian government. So from, from a survival standpoint, I'd probably tell the managers to just go hedge against re I risk. It's too dangerous for you and lose your job. It's nothing to do with shareholders. It's about job security. And let's face it, that is often the biggest reason why managers hedge against exchange rate risk. It gives them job security. It gives them more stable earnings. And we know that managers at companies with more stable earnings might not see higher stock prices, but they're less likely to be fired. So you're saying, what the hell is this picture? 
So a few years ago, somebody asked me, and called me and said, should I hedge exchange rate risk? Well, actually, should I hedge risk? Basically, it's a broad question. And I started looking through the literature, and there was this all these different papers pulling in different directions. Some said hedge, some. So I decided to draw a flow chart. So hang in there with me. So I'll be a manager. You be the person helping me. Here's how the flow chart starts. You want to hedge, or I want to hedge a risk. Cost you, the question you should ask me is, is there a cost to hedging this risk? If there's no cost to hedging a risk, then why are you even wasting your time asking me whether you should hedge a risk? Just go hedge the damn risk. You think, what kind of risk can you hedge at no cost? You know, one of the risks that retailers face is location risk. You know what I mean by location risk? You build a big store on a highway and then somebody builds another highway and all the traffic moves off. There goes the revenues for the store. You know how big retailers deal with location risk? By opening stores in more locations. If you're a single store, of course you worry about location. So you hedge away the risk in the process of doing operations. So if there's no cost to hedging, of course you should hedge the risk. But if there is a cost to hedging, then the sensible follow-up question is, is there a benefit that exceeds the cost, right? So let's say work that through. If there's a benefit, it's got to show up either as less risk, you know, lower discount rate, or as higher cash flows. And here are some of the potential higher cash flow arguments. There are some risks if you hedge, but you can actually reduce your tax rate over time. One example was in the early 1980s in the US, there was a tax on super normal profits designed explicitly for oil companies because they were making so much money in the 70s. So what oil companies discovered is by hedging risk, they could keep their earnings below that level and pay less in taxes. That's higher cash flows. That's an example where hedging actually pays off, pays off as higher cash flows. Or maybe hedging a risk will make you a less risky company. Investors demand either a lower cost of equity or more likely a lower cost of debt. Remember, bankers lend based on your earnings. So if you hedge risk, you might be able to borrow at a lower rate. So if there's a benefit, I want to see if there's a benefit and if that benefit exceeds the cost. So you're saying if the benefit exceeds the cost, should I hedge? Not so fast because I'm going to ask you a final question, which is, are you the most efficient person to hedge this risk? Or could your investors do it cheaper? You think, how can my investors do it cheaper? Remember the example I gave you for Disney, your biggest investors are BlackRock and Fidelity and State Street. I can wager that they can hedge exchange rate risk cheaper than you can because they have 100 stocks in their portfolio. 80% of the risk is already gone. They can choose to hedge the remaining 20%, whereas you're hedging each company at a time, the exchange rate risk you face. You know what, if you follow this flow chart, only about 20% of the risks that you see that are hedged today would continue to be hedged. We have, in my view, we have over hedging. We have people hedging risks that they should not be hedging. You know why? Because the people selling you the risk and the people buying the risk are actually have very different incentives than the people paying for the risk. Stockholders pay to hedge these risks but the benefits accrue to bankers and managers. And guess what? They overmanage risk. So when you, if you end up in a corporate job as a, in, a, in a finance group, this question is going to come up, should we hedge this risk? And you're going to be tempted. There are so many different products out there to hedge risk. But before you go down that path, pull out this flow chart and work through it and see, does this make sense for my company given, so if you're a small company with domestic investors, maybe you might have to hedge the risk, but if you're a multinational with global investors, a lot of these risks you should just let pass through. In fact, one of my books is called Strategic Risk Management. You know, you know how much, uh, you know, I didn't want to use the word strategic in my title, it's my least favorite word in business. The very fact that I used it tells you how much I was forced but it's about essentially looking at a question that every business faces. What risk should I pass through to my shareholders? What risk should I bear? And what risk should I manage? It's about using risk management to increase value rather than reduce risk exposure. But this is one of the tables I go through. So you get a chance, go through that table. It's again, not rocket science. It's just a common sense way of asking, should I be the one hedging this risk? Matthew?
Uh, yeah, I was wondering, Professor, does it depend, like whether or not you hedge, does it depend at all on your ability to sell at the spot rate versus if you have like pre-specified prices that you would sell for if you're a supplier, for example? Like, let's well, say I think what, yeah, so when you hedge, you're locking in a price, right? Right. If right. you're in a business where that price, and the reason you're locking in is, is it volatile, the price? Is that why you're locking yeah, in? Yeah, so if, like, let, let's say you're like a U.S., iron company and you're exporting to Japan, but you enter into right. a contract that says, you know, over the next 10 years, we're going to export this amount of iron for this price over the next, like, and, like, and you're like going to lock price. in both the price and the currency. So you're going to do it in dollars. So you're not, ex so basically that's more, that is not, that is probably more of an exchange rate hedge. Right. Right. Commodity price would you, rates, right? Like, would, would that be like a scenario where you'd want to lock in the exchange rate so that maybe, you know, if you're, exporting to Japan. I'll, like I'll tell you when, when I would do it. If I have a very slim margin where small changes in the price can put me underwater and I have debt, then survival is at stake, right? If the price moves enough, I could go bankrupt. Then I would lock it in because that's the only way I survive. If my margins are hefty, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let it flow through. Because if I go and hedge it in, I might sleep better at night as a manager but I'm paying for something that really doesn't benefit my shareholders. I'll tell you, I'm more inclined to hedge costs than revenues. I'll give you an example. If you're Hershey's, a lot of inputs that are commodities, right? Whether it's chocolate or sugar, you might want to lock in those costs because you want to be able to set prices which you think are reasonable prices. So as a general rule, I think hedging costs is more defensible than hedging revenues. And when you hedge costs, you got to focus on the costs which are most volatile, where you worry the most. So what I'm saying is, you know, that hedging makes sense, but only after you've checked all the boxes and made sure that this is something that you can tell your shareholders you will be, they will benefit and you can show that this is where the benefits show up. We can have, and I'll tell you, Southwest hedges oil prices. You know why Southwest hedges? It's one, of, I described it as one of the two airlines that consistently hedges oil prices. The reason they hedge oil prices is unlike other airlines, they like to have a fixed fare structure. They don't like to kind of go up and down. So it's predictable. It's what makes them attractive to their customers. So they hedge because it builds into their business model. So my point is, if you can show me a link to a business model that this makes you a better company, a better business, I'm willing to go along, but hedging and saying my earnings are less variable is I think a very weak argument. And unfortunately, that's the one I hear most often. Why are you hedging? Because the earnings become more stable. Any other questions on hedging? Henry? So I, I guess I'm thinking through the, if, if, you know, if I'm putting money into the BlackRock mid cap, you know, mid cap equity fund focused on, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, right? In your, it should be. I'm putting money into the the BlackRock mid cap equity plus, you know, plus commodities hedging or whatever underlying risk hedging fund. Like what I'm I'm thinking through the how like the big mutual funds would act in the way that they actually allocate money and the rules around what they can do. Like how does that work with their ability? Well, do they, so you're asking do the do the big mutual funds hedge against exchange rate risk? Generally well, not. Exchange rate risk, but like the commodity risk and the underlying the underlying things that are closer to the businesses. It, they don't. The reason is they assume that when you invest, you want to be exposed. The problem that mutual funds face is they don't know what you were thinking when you invested in a particular company. So maybe you're making a bet that, oh, so let's say you value an airline and you believe that oil prices are going to continue to decrease and that's why you bought an airline. The problem with the mutual fund stepping in and starting to hedge risk, they might undercut the reasons you bought into that. So if you have a mutual fund whose specialty is, we call macro, and I'll give you an example. We're good at macro predictions. That's why, so ARC for instance, is a terrible you know, valuation, but they call macro trends. You want to hedge away other risks to focus on what you think is your central strength. I have no problem with you doing it as long as you deliver results, right? So if you're a mutual fund and you start hedging things, you better be good at whatever your focus is because if you're not, I'm gonna come back and punish you for creating all these costs for me and not delivering on what you told me was your central thing. So I think it varies widely. Most mutual funds don't hedge 
partly because they bring so little to the table. The more, the, if you go to the hedge funds, you're more likely to see more hedging because they think they have special skills and they want to focus on those. The more you want to focus on something special, the more you want to hedge away things that will create noise around your special skill. So I think it depends on who you invest in and what they claim to be their competitive advantage, what they bring to the table. Yeah. Any other questions? So let's do one final project and then we'll end. This is going to be a big one, an acquisition. And I've never quite, as I said early in this class, I said I've never understood why acquisitions have been treated differently from traditional projects. To me, an acquisition is a gigantic capital budgeting project. And everything we've said about individual projects apply to acquisitions. One is, if you do a good acquisition, the acquisition should have positive net present value. In other words, the price you pay for the acquisition should be less than the present value of the cash flows you receive, including synergy, strategic benefits. You can bring in whatever you want as benefits, but it has to show up in cash flows. Or I could do the IRR in an acquisition has to be greater than the hurdle rate. So I'm not denying the existence of synergy or whatever other benefits you have, but. I, uh, my argument is has to show up in the cash flows. So I'm gonna create a hypothetical acquisition with one of my companies. Tata Motors is an automobile company. Harman International is a high-end audio company. So some of you might have Harman audio you know, speakers, et cetera. So it's been around a long time. And Tata Motors is planning to buy Harman. So remember Tata Motors is an Indian company with a global revenue base because of its acquisition of Jaguar Land Rover, it's looking at Harman. So I'm gonna give you the numbers for Harman and we're gonna do an acquisition valuation, even though this is an evaluation class, we're gonna treat it like a capital budgeting project. So I want to value Harman. Remember the rule for discount rates on projects, a discount rate for a project should reflect the risk of the project, right? So when I'm valuing a company in an acquisition, guess whose discount rate I'm focused on? It's not the acquiring company's cost of equity capital that matters, it's the target company because that's the project. So in this case, I'm going to give you the specifics of the target company. The first is, it's a US company, so I'm gonna give you all the cash flows in dollars. It's probably easier to do it in US dollars than in Indian rupees. Second, Harman is an electronics company and the beta for electronics companies at the time that I did this, the unleavened beta is 1.17. You're saying, but Tata Motors is an automobile company. It doesn't matter. This is an electronics company you're buying. The beta is that of an electronics company. Harman's revenues come from, you know, from a global distribution, much of it coming from US and Germany, 27% of the US, 34% from Germany. And my equity risk premium reflects where Harman gets its revenues. Notice my focus is on Harman. It's not on Tata Motors because Harman is the target company. And for the debt, Harman has a debt to cap ratio of about 7% and its pre-tax cost of debt is 4.75% based on, again, Harman's rating. When you value target companies, please don't bring in the acquiring company into the mix when you value the target company. It's all about the target company. And if I play that out, the cost of capital in US dollars, and I'm doing everything in US dollars for this for Harman is 9.67%. Now, this to me seems like common sense, but you know, in half of all acquisitions, people screw up. Guess whose cost of capital ends up being used to value the target company in half of all acquisitions? It's the acquiring company. And you can see the logic, right? We raise the capital, so it's our cost. So using Tata Motors cost of capital to value harm and you've already lost the game. It doesn't matter how well you forecast the cash flows, you're using the wrong company's discount rate. It's all about the target company. And it's an extension of what we said about individual projects, the risk of the project that drives the discount rate, not the risk of the entity looking at the project. So my cost of capital is 9.67%. I'm gonna keep my valuation simple. I'm gonna make harm in a mature company. What does that allow me to do? I don't have to do forecasts of cash flows for a long period. But in the most recent year, their operating income was 201.25 million on revenues of 4.3 billion. So they have margins of about, operating margins of about 
if you add back some non-recurring expenses, you know, which they claim was one, one time, and I'm taking them at their word, their adjusted operating income is about 313 million. The reason I said their word is often companies claim to have non-recurring expenses, but you see them popping up every three or four years. I'm assuming that this is, these are truly non-recurring and that their revenues reflect. The company paid 18.2% of its income as taxes. That's its effective tax rate. Now, in terms of reinvestment, the company had capital expenditures of about 206 million and depreciation of 128. Notice that I'm giving you the numbers that I've given you in a typical project. They just look much bigger. That's all the difference is when you do acquisitions is every number is gonna have hundreds of millions rather than just millions. And my non-cash working capital increased by 273 million in 2013, but it's about 13.5% of revenues. I really wanted to add a twist to your G-car case. You know what I could have done? I could have given you the project and then I said, there's an alternative path for Google to go. Instead of building its own plant, it could buy Nikola or it could buy Neo. It would have been exactly what you did in the individual project, but now you're going to be looking at buying a company rather than building up from scratch. An acquisition is just a big project. Everything you do on a project, you're also going to do on an acquisition. So I'm gonna to try to value harm in audio. And I'm gonna assume it's a mature firm growing at a constant rate forever. You know what that buys me, right? If I have a cash flow growing at a constant rate forever, I can use that neat little equation, the perpetual growth equation. And to use that equation, I need my expected cash flows next year. That's all I need. So to get my expected cash flows next year, 2013 is my base year, I grow my revenues out 2.75%. So that's 4.3 going to 4.4 billion. My operating income also grows out at 2.75% because my margins are staying fixed. I'm paying the effective tax rate. And that we can argue, maybe the tax rate could change, but I'm leaving the tax rate where it is. Come up with an after-tax operating income. What are the three steps to get to cash flows when I did a project? Add back depreciation, subtract CapEx, subtract change in working capital. You know what? If you can do capital budgeting, you can do valuation. They're the same process of going from earnings to cash flows. These, of course, are cash flows to the firm. Why? Because I haven't factored in interest expenses. I'm not looking at debt repayments, but that's intentional. I'm looking at cash flows before debt payments. My expected cash flow next year is going to be $167 million. That's it. I have everything I need. I take the expected cash flow. Because it's a perpetual growth company, you take the difference between the cost of capital that I estimate for Harman, 9.67%, and the growth rate forever of 2.75%, I get a value for Harman's operating assets of two and a half billion. Because I'm buying the entire company, I do get the 515 million in cash that they carry, but I also have to assume the 313 million in debt that they have. My value of equity is 2.7 billion. I've essentially taken capital budgeting and applied it to value target company. The actual market value of equity for Harman was 5.4 billion. So if you're Tata Motors and say, should I buy the company based on this valuation? My answer is don't even think about it. The value of this company is only 2.7 billion. You're paying 5.4 billion. But then you know what you're gonna bring up, right? But there's synergy. You're right, I haven't built in synergy yet. I'm gonna hold off on that because next session, I'm gonna talk about what if there's synergy, how would I estimate it and how would I bring it into the process? But the first step in an acquisition before you even talk about synergy is to value the target company based on its risk characteristics, its debt ratio, its cash flows. Don't even bring in what will happen after the merger because this is your starting point for every acquisition valuation. Any questions on? Okay, so let's, you know, rather than going to the next session, I want to review the, the three projects we've looked at so far. We looked at the Rio Disney theme park, right? Made a lot of forecasts, but we projected out operating income, which is income to all investors, but we didn't do any interest expense or anything. We stopped our operating income. We computed after tax operating income and cash flows before debt payments. And there, 
the discount rate we used was the cost of capital for theme parks. And we brought in the Brazil effect into the discount rate. The discount rate reflected the investment and where it was being made. Then we moved to the iron ore mine in Canada. And there I used the dollar cost of equity because I decided to do all the cash flows after debt payments. And my cash flows were in US dollars. And there the big risks were not micro risks, they were macro risks. What will happen to the iron ore price? What will happen to exchange rates? And we talked about, should we be hedging against that risk? And the final investment is the big one, doing an acquisition. And the key, I hope you get out of what I did with Harman Audio is not the computation of cash flows, but the rule that the discount rate used to value a target company should reflect the risk of the target company, not the risk of the acquiring company, not how much debt and equity they use, but the risk of the target company. If that's all you take out of those last few pages, that's all that, that's a huge accomplishment because that is one of those things that people mangle all the time in terms of valuing companies. They take weighted averages, they take the acquiring companies, cost of capital, don't mess around. It's always about the target company. Any final questions before? No. So Hi, that's Professor. about it. Yeah, go ahead. I have a quick question on the on the last example we just went through. Just mm -hmm. for the working yep. capital, it seemed that the change in working capital for the 2014 was really small compared to the growth. The that's a good that point. You, you know how I got the change? I took 13% of the change in revenues. The reason I don't want to take the dollar change last year is that reflected something weird. That's why it's often with working capital rather than look at the dollar change from the previous year, especially if you're looking at a company where strange things can happen. I look at the working capital as a percent of revenues. And I think that I gave it to you as 13.5%. So you take the change in revenues from 2013 to 2014, 13.78% is 16 million. This is a slow growing company. It's working capital shouldn't be jumping around that much. So 16 million is more reflective of that slow growth company than taking the 273 million and putting it into the next year. Any other questions? Okay, next class, what we're going to do actually is talk about um, interaction between projects, choosing between projects, which is so far, every project we've looked at is a standalone project, right? Theme park, take it or leave it. Iron ore mine, take it or leave it. Acquisition, do it or don't do it. In the next class, we're gonna talk about picking between projects, either because they're linked at the hip or they're mutually exclusive. Now, Cody at the start of this class was talking about you know, cost savings project. What kind of cost savings would that be, Cody? What, what, what kind of project was it that saves costs? Uh, taking away human um, work for, I guess, headcount, reducing headcount for uh, claims reviews. Okay, so are there two, uh, is there more than one way you could cut costs? Are there like two or three different choices you face? I guess there are incremental projects that we're looking at doing that kind of build upon each other. Okay, or you could, I mean, an example I counted was the inventory control example, right? You have lots of inventory, you're thinking about investing in a system to manage inventory better. You shop around, there are three systems you could buy, ranging from cheaper to more expensive. You have to pick one. If you pick one, you can't pick the other two. Those are called mutually exclusive investments. We're gonna talk about how to deal with those. None of that really matters for your GCAR. For your GCAR project, you're pretty much done with all of the, the stuff you need to get the project rolled out. So don't hold back if you haven't really started working on it, expecting some deep insight to come in. Because if there's deep insights, it's either there already or it's never coming. So you know, just get to work because the next session, as I said, we'll, we'll move on to the next phase of investment analysis. Okay, so I'll wrap up and I will see you on Wednesday. We're next week. Monday. I'm sorry, what? Next week, Monday. What about we have classes on Tuesday? Oh, that's right. Uh, next Monday. Sorry, sorry. You have no class on Wednesday. Sorry. That is, that's right. Next Monday. So keep working on the case. If you have questions, of course, I mean, I'll be around pretty much all week answering questions. So I'll see you next Monday.
Where do we download the crystal ball stuff that you were talking about? Is it just in the MIT libraries? It's it's in Stern Links. So basically, go to I think Stern Links under Apps maybe. So if you go into Stern Links, I think there's an Apps NYU Apps thing. You click on that, you see Crystal Ball. It'll actually download and run it on a computer. You can run it remotely. It's not actually downloaded directly onto a computer. It runs the Stern version of Crystal Ball, but it'll take any of your Excel existing Excel spreadsheets, and you can put them into Crystal Ball and make it into a simulation. Okay, thank you. Okay. If I get a chance, I'll, I'll put together a little instruction sheet on how to do it, so, yeah. Thanks, Professor. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you. Um, just